Hello, welcome to my unit on the novel Fahrenheit 451. This unit will be structured a little differently than how Mr. Sainsbury's units usually work, so I understand if there are some of you who struggle with the change. The biggest difference in this unit are these videos. I will be utilizing videos to introduce and reinforce content. These videos are for you to watch during our asynchronous time or whether they are assigned at home. But what are we going to be doing during our asynchronous time then? Well, we are going to be utilizing that time for discussing the novel, answering questions, or working together on assignment. Because we are flipping the classroom, so to speak, there will be more frequent check-ins for understanding of material presented outside of the class time in multiple ways. To get most of out of this unit, I recommend that you keep a planner or to-do list. It'll have at the end of every presentation, including this one, a checklist that you can easily copy down and follow along yourself. So make sure to take time at the end of this video to get acquainted with it. Take a moment to pause this video and write down any questions you have about this video, the unit, or any other classroom related questions as we go through this video and going forward with any video that is assigned. Now that we have the basics covered, we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about the novel. Our goals for this unit are as follows. Analyze and interpret Fahrenheit 451, and when I write F451, I mean Fahrenheit 451, it's just a shorthand. So whenever you see that, just know that I'm referring to the novel. It says use text to support your analysis, discuss Fahrenheit 451 to explain your understanding of the text, utilizing writing strategies to write a formal essay, and use themes of Fahrenheit 451 to connect to real wor world examples. That is something I want to emphasize for this unit is connecting the social commentary of Fahrenheit 451 to our current day world. So here's some historical context for this novel. So first of all, um, this novel takes place in the 50s, which means it's the end of, of World War II. This means returning to normalcy, men are coming back from the war and want to join the workforce. Women are going back into the homes and veteran, a lot of veterans are left with severe trauma and are jobless. This is the rise of veterans affairs and things like that. McCarthyism, which you may or may not recognize, but it is described as a thorough hunt for communists in the U.S. government launched by Senator John McCarthy, hence the name. It started in the first half of the 50s. People who are accused of communism would often lose their jobs or put on a blacklist, even if it was proven they were not communists. So this means that there were severe implications of being called a communist. So it was really bad to be a communist. And, you know, anyone who followed outside the social norm was ostracized for this. Another big part of this era was the threat of nuclear war, which it refers to the Red War or the Cold War or, um, you know, those kinds of terms between the U.S. and the USSR, so at the time, the, the Russian government. Uh, the space race, if you've heard that before, in the early 60s and 50s, had to do with this tension and really exemplified it. You know, USSR and the USA were fighting to see who would be the first person or first country to put someone on the moon, and this tension between the two countries were really, like, amplified and put into the space race and made it all the more kind of big pressure. There was also the rise in popularity of science fiction. These novels were escaped from the real world and examined humanity and society through a different lens. So although science fiction had been going on for a very long time, the science fiction genre itself didn't become normalized and popular until this era. So moving forward with historical context, one really important thing that I already kind of touched on was gender roles. Women were expected to go back to the homes, be quiet, subservient to men again, have children, look after the home. And this is where the term nuclear family comes from. Although the phrase nuclear family had been around way before the 50s and the 60s, it is now very closely tied to the idea of nuclear energy from this era. Post-World War II, America was a rapidly changing social landscape that many saw as threatening to the classic structure of a nuclear family, that being a mother, a father, and two children, often one boy and one girl. Women not wanting to leave the workforce was a direct threat to the traditional family structure and roles. A lot of science fiction from this era directly comments on those horrors of the breakdown of traditional family structure, leading to the breakdown of the family value, then, as far as morality itself, 
This fear is still alive today within our society. It's negative perspective on single parent homes. Often society believes that there's something inherently wrong with non-traditional family structures. Whether this is a valid view or not is another story. Another aspect is the rise of technology, TVs coming into the home. More homes were starting to get more technology and one of those technology was TVs. A lot of parents had fear that, you know, TVs are going to rot the children's brains just like today. And the fear of technology taking over. Think about Terminator. That's where that kind of ideology came from, you know, the scary unknown. TV also became a space to sell anything. TV producers were quickly learning women stuck at home were an untapped market to sell just about anything to. They saw the rise of soap operas, long-winded TV shows strategically timed to reach the most mothers at home, which ties into... Another aspect is the rise of mass consumerism. Grocery stores became a regular common thing. Single-use plastics and waste were on the, on the forefront of technology at the time, and the ideology that you could just buy a new one instead of repairing anything. After the Great Depression and wartime rationing, the economic upturn in the 50s led people to consume more. Moving away from holding back in the previous two decades, the general feeling was more the merrier it seemed in the 50s. This attitude even translated into a baby boom. Young families were having babies like crazy post-war. Both of my parents are baby boomers, in fact. The biggest products of the era was technology like TVs, cars, and refrigerators. The rise of TV and later the Hollywood golden era, more and more people had the ability to compare their lifestyle to an idealized one, which led to, in turn to even more spending. Advertising was in its prime now, reaching even more people in many more ways than ever before. So here we're talking about setting. When we are interpreting the novel, we want to consider the historical setting. So when did the novel take place? When was it written? And those are kind of some of the things that we've covered already. The physical setting, you know, whether it's in a city, a suburban, urban, rural area, those kinds of things, those are important to the kind of cultural dynamic that the characters have, but also how they live within that space. And then the social setting. So we talked about McCarthyism, but in the novel, there's going to be, you know, how do certain classes interact, how do certain, you know, people interact, and those kinds of things, and those all kind of play into setting more than just a physical location. So characters, Guy Montag is the protagonist, and, you know, it might be related to Guy Fawkes Day, which as I'm recording it, is today, who is a person in British history who uh, blew up Parliament. So very interesting. It's also a reference to a paper company. We also have Clarissa, who is getting on the story. She is a character that kind of brings knowledge and information to Guy and kind of enlightens him. So it says, form of Clara, which is Latin for bright, associated with light and brightness, separate from that of fire, you know. So I want you to consider, you know, what is light often a metaphor for? So what might Clarissa might be a metaphor for? So consider that. Also, Faber is the name of a pencil company. So themes, here's some of the themes that we're going to be talking about. Individual self-expression is important. Being unique and individual is you know, important to who you are, but also how you interact with others. Violence is self-destructive. Mindless pleasure-seeking and materialism make for empty life. And this kind of connects back to that consumerism aspect of the 50s and, like, technology rising. So he managed to preserve and value the culture of the past. You know, the past and history are important, and we should learn from them, reflect on them, and keep them and value them. And instead of, you know, blindly moving forward with technology, we should consider the past and learn from it. Manly has the ability to be reborn and revived in the wrong hands. Modern technology could be dangerous. That kind of, this kind of goes back to the same kind of idea of, like, Terminator I was talking about earlier. Commercialism it can erode the spiritual values. So commercialism is similar to consumerism in that kind of way. You know, everything is a product and you can buy it. People lose their humanity when not being able to communicate and interact with each other on a personal level. So we've kind of experienced this in... Um, pandemic life where we, you know you can't interact with your friends you can't go see people yeah maybe not um 
you know, you can't see them on a physical level anymore, but it's still hard to connect over technology. And I think that um, Fahrenheit 451 really exemplifies that same kind of feeling that we're all feeling during the pandemic, that we're disconnected from other people. So symbols, this harkens back to, you know, what I was talking about with the light and the metaphor for light. But fire, burning things, water, the salamander, mechanical hound, seashells, parlor walls, and titles of each section are all symbols. So when we're doing our text analysis, you can look for these things and you'll always find something kind of, as it obviously states, a symbol. But it also leads you to some further thinking. When you find these things in a novel, maybe dig a little deeper and go, hmm, why are they talking about that? Why should I pay attention to that? And why is Ray Bradbury using this symbol to say something? So fire imagery, we talked about imagery in our last unit. We talked about how it helps us build a picture and also... You know, I like I like to think about it, and a lot of teachers, fellow students, like to think about imagery as like creating a movie in your head. So when you think about *Of Mice and Men*, we talked about imagery with the opening scene, and one of the images, and you know, throughout the entire novel of Fahrenheit 455 is imagery. And so it says many cultures have gods associated with fire. Egyptians goddess Skemet. I'm not sure if I can say that even close to correct. <laughs> also, there is many myths that try to explain the origin. Greek myth about Prometheus stealing fire from the gods. I here have, you know, fire equals light equals enlightenment equals knowledge. So the reason why Prometheus got in trouble for, you know, giving fire to the humans from the gods is because fire and light our knowledge and it, or power and they didn't want humans to be like gods if if humans had access to fire what would be the difference between humans and gods anymore not that much and that's why prometheus was got in big trouble if you know that story about greek mythology i really like greek mythology so if you want to talk about greek mythology i'm here for it <laughs> scientists also used to believe that all matter was made up of the four elements fire earth water and air like Avatar The Last Airbender, <laughs> if you know that. So, um, you know, fire has had a long history of playing an important role in our culture and in our mythology and stuff like that. So Ray Barry Ray likes to touch on those things as well. So science fiction itself, like I said, is a rising genre of this era. It's considered a speculative fiction. A speculative fiction is basically a fiction, a work of fiction. Fiction is basically a fiction. A work of fiction, um, you know, make believe that speculates or guesses or makes assumptions about, you know, what the future might be like or a grand society and some other planet might be. There's a lot of science fiction TV nowadays, so you might have encountered it yourself. Star Wars, Star Trek, those kinds of things, they're all sci fi. So, sci fi as a genre will criticize or make comments on modern society. Also, it's commonly referred to as social pro protests. Star Wars is a social protest, it's making commentary on dictatorships. Avatar that came out a few years ago, the big blue people avatar, that avatar, not um, Last Airbender, was also a social protest talking about imperialism and, you know, colonialism. So like I said about technology, it was leading people to be, you know, wonder and curious and, you know, technology was at its forefront and, you know, there was all these advancements during World War II and people were curious and making breakthroughs and they kind of embraced that but also feared that. And that is really portrayed in science fiction, that kind of, you know, what happens if we take every single piece of technology or replace everything with technology or if we completely live in a technological society, what's going to happen? So, and that's that speculative aspect. What if, what would happen if something, we, something like this? I like to think of, you know, the birth of the science fiction genre, especially in TV, as Star Trek. And, you know, in the 60s, this was like groundbreaking stuff. Star Trek was amazing and crazy. Doctor Who is also another really good science fiction TV show from the really early beginning eras of science fiction. So here you can see that I have a video and it is an audio book of The Progestrian by Ray Bradbury and that is going to be our activity for in class today and I just wanted to introduce it now before um, you know class starts. We're going to, I'm going to have you read and listen to The Pedestrian on your own time and you can easily find it by googling.
can read and listen to The Pedestrian on your own time, and you can easily find it by Googling The Pedestrian by Ray Bradbury, but it is also linked in this presentation for you to listen to. So listen along. You're going to look for some of those historical context aspects of what we've been talking about in the story, so that you know, fear of technology, you know, gender roles, people coming back from the war, you know, McCarthyism, those kinds of things. Look for that in pedestrian. I also want you to look for features of science fiction, you know, maybe criticize and comment on modern society that might be in there. The rise of technology, speculating what would happen if this happened. So look for those while you're listening to the pedestrian and Write down some questions that you have about it and some of those things that you notice on a piece of paper or in a journal in your journal so that we can talk about it in class. All right. OK, so this is the you know, kind of checklist that I was talking about at the beginning. So here we have the date for our first class. You can see here. So Thursday, Friday, it's the same. And uh, you guys will be doing the same thing whether you're our Thursday or Friday class. But today is this intro video. This is literally what we're watching right now. So due on the 12th and the 13th, you've had to, have to watch this video. And then in class on the, that day, we're going to do a question and answer about this video. So make sure to write down some questions. And when it says discussion questions, this is the pedestrian. Um, that's what we're going to talk about for our discussion that day. Thank you for listening. And you can see here, you know, I've got us all planned out. You can kind of look into what we're going to be doing. So thank you for listening. Uh, if you want to get ahead, I would recommend start reading Fahrenheit 451. It is a little bit harder of a read than Of Mice and Men, so it's going to take a little bit longer to get through. I recommend checking out the library and seeing if they have a audio recording of it and listening along while you read that might help you get through it maybe reading it with your parents or your family or someone in your life so you guys can discuss it that might help you get through it it is a tough read I know I, I read it when I was in ninth grade as well so I get it I was right there with you guys so yeah if you want to get ahead for Monday and Tuesday so read Fahrenheit 451 we're gonna have part one finished by Monday slash Tuesday, depending what class you guys are in. And you can take a look at our journal assignment. And actually, I will introduce that right now. Here we go. Let me scroll up. So we are going to be doing a journal. So basically, all of your assignments for this unit are going to be in your journal. This just makes it easier for me to look at it, easier for you guys to find it. So it's all in one place. And, you know, we don't have to go scrounging through everything to find, um, you know, the assignment. And I know that's something we've been struggling with. So this is the same kind of um, assignment as you guys have been doing for Of Mice and Men. So evidence from the text, this means it has to be a quote. Okay. And then in here is your interpretation. So why does your quote, you know, prove your point about, you know, your literary device? So, um. We're going to be introducing more literary devices. I introduced some of the themes for this unit in this video. So you can utilize a theme, you know, historical context, those kinds of things, literary device or concepts you found. So you're going to explain how and why you're going to be basically doing the exact same thing you did for Of Mice and Men in this journal format here. You know, we're going to write an essay about this in the future. We finish this unit. So the better you do on this, the more thorough you are now, the easier it's going to be. Trust me, get the hard work done early. And you know, when we come comes time to the essay, you're going to have it boom, 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 all done. Each assignment is labeled with a week and a day. So this is week one, day one. And so in your checklist, that's how it's referred to as week one, day one. So day one, day two, you're always going to have a Wednesday prompt on day two. So here are the instructions for the prompt, and then the prompt itself is going to be there. I want you to, you know, it doesn't have to be a certain length. I'm not going to say a length requirement, but I will say I want at least every 
you know, at the least, every question thoroughly explained and answered, you know, using complete sentences, complete thoughts. There are multiple questions in this prompt. As you can tell, there's lots of question marks in here. So I want you guys to really think about and consider. And for this prompt, especially since we are talking about school, you know, I'm really interested in what you guys have to say. I really want to hear about what you think about school, um, especially now that it's become virtual and it's kind of looking a lot more like like Fahrenheit 451, if you start reading it, you'll realize like, oh my gosh, am I, am I living in this world right now? As you go through on your Wednesday prompts, you're going to have, you know, prompts that you want to answer thoroughly. So remember at any time, pause this video and write down some questions because every single class after you have a video, we're going to have a question and answer section where you can ask questions about assignments, about the video, those kinds of things. And then there will be a day three, which is either Thursday or Friday. So here for week one, it's literary device dictionary. We're going to have another video that covers literary devices. And that is, you know, on top of our imagery, foreshadowing and symbolism. And so when you do do your text analysis assignment for day ones, you can use the new literary devices that we covered, including, you know, imagery, foreshadowing and symbolism. So this is the main document you're going to be looking for for assignments and homework. There's also another document. This is the other document you'll be looking for for your assignments for this unit is called the discussion packet. This means that as all the questions that we will be covering for section one, two, and three, there's only three sections. So each week we're going to cover a different section and there'll be three weeks. Here it has the instructions up at the top. You know, it says answer all the questions as we read through the book. I do not turn it in until we answer the question all the questions you know they need to be complete sentences and complete and clear thoughts questions will be discussed in class feel free to add to your answer if something comes up in class that you want to you know that adds to your understanding or interpretation if you have the questions completed before coming to class you'll be called upon it says here that you have to have all the the questions that are assigned to you finished before you come to class and you'll be called upon to answer. Participation is a mandatory requirement prior your grade and I'll continue to talk about that later in this video as well. So here you can see there's questions and you will be assigned a question. I think I briefly mentioned this earlier in the video but I really need us to participate in discussion and so part of that you know that I've been watching for of mice and men is we're not getting everyone involved so this time you're going to be randomly assigned a question you know I'll pull a name from the popsicle stick jar and you will be assigned a random question and you'll re be responsible for answering that question bringing it to class and having it answered and then you will pre present the answer just like how we've been doing it in For Of Mice and Men. I really want to really press on the fact that discussion and participation is a big part of your grade, especially when I'm trusting you guys to watch these videos on your own. I really want to trust you guys. I respect your time. I, res I respect and value your input, and I really want to hear it. And so I don't want you to make you uncomfortable or push you to do something that makes you upset. But I really want you guys to, you know, feel comfortable and feel like you are bringing something to the table because you are. I really liked talking in my English classes. I love talking in them now. You know, they're one of my favorite classes because I get to just let my brain flow and think and really kind of like push myself to learn and I really want you guys to experience that and part of the reason why I became an English teacher is because I wanted people to enjoy English as much as I enjoy English so I really want you guys to enjoy class when you know you guys show that you can participate without me you know hounding on you or pressuring you or, then we can have more fun you know so for now we're gonna assign you questions and um, you know hopefully in the future it will get you know a little bit easier and we'll have a good time you know it could be worse you could have to do all the questions like I did when I was in class that could be horrible trust me it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort so you know just do your one question bring them to class and you know we'll get it done and out of the way 
So yeah, thank you for watching this video. Like I've mentioned multiple times, don't be afraid to pause the video, take notes, write down questions. I do re really recommend watching the video a couple times. There's a lot of information that I covered in this video. So, you know, make sure you get it all down. And, you know, if you have questions, remember we're going to have a Q&A session here on Thursday, Friday. And we will talk about the pedestrian. So make sure you listen to that. Thank you for you know, listening and sitting with me and, and you know, working with me on this unit. I uh, have been working on it for a while and I'm really excited to teach you guys. I got to do this book when I was in ninth grade and when I found out I was going to do it, I was really excited but also kind of nervous because I remember not liking this book when I was your age. But, you know, now as an adult and, you know, the more books I've read, I've really come to appreciate the perspective that Fahrenheit 451 has. And so I'm really looking forward to um, learning and discovering with you guys. I'm very curious about all your opinions, you know, and um, I'm a student too. Like, that's why they call me a student teacher. I'm here to learn from you guys and from Mr. Stansberry and, you know, learn so that I can have a good classroom. So, uh, you know, thank you and try your best. And I look forward to seeing you in class.